Made in New York podcast with um, film producer, is that director, yep. sorry, film director, Eric Rivas, who's done a trilogy of movies, um, and I'm going to have him tell a little bit more about it. Yeah, um, it's a vamp biker series. I call it Vamp Bikers because it's vampires and bikers. I had been working on a film uh, that won the Coney Island Film Festival, and I worked with a bunch of real outlaw bikers, and they were so good on set that I decided to bring them in to a vamp a vamp biker series of films. Well, not series, a trilogy. It winded up becoming a trilogy. And, um, you know, vampires come into a town of bikers. They start biting them. Bikers become vamp bikers. Then vamp bikers against original bikers. And it's really a battle for the soul. So you would say that the last biker probably wakes up and realizes that he's fighting true evil. And they've been wearing the patches of 666 and all that, not realizing what they've been calling into their lives all these years. So, you know, it's almost uh, like he'd have to wake up and almost change his life to fight them, you know? So, so, so the original plan was one movie. It was just one, yeah. And then it went well and it was like, yeah, let's I, just do I this. Mean, I mean, since 2003, I haven't been able to stop making movies. I don't know why. I just, they, they, whenever there's a gap, I just keep going. So this particular thing, I mean, and of course, you know, it's a stream of conscious thing because I don't really set out to, to like, I'm going to make three films. I don't, I don't think that way. It just sort of happened. And then, you know, part two got into witches. You know, that witches came along and they started picking up the bikers and hypnotizing them and playing with them and all this stuff. And before you know it, it's more like a mental game part two, whereas uh, they're almost subjugated by, and it's fantastic now with the Me Too movement, with women, that mm -hmm. women completely have taken over, and these guys are just basically at their mercy. Mm -hmm. And then by the time we get to three, you realize that this particular guy, because my character loses his daughter in an amusement park, and he gets bit, so he becomes a vampire. He's like the king vampire. But he, the whole trilogy, he's kind of looking for his daughter. At the end of the movie, you know, the third one, you realize that uh, he was in a hospital. Michael Musto is a crazy doctor. Mm -hmm. And um, you realize that he was in a hospital being fucked with. And that he was there for like dream therapy with a bunch of guys making ten thousand dollars for a weekend, you know, like specimens, and uh, they were all in each other's dreams. And basically, him losing his daughter was more like his mental state. He's he's crazy, so the, the state took away his daughter. So it it goes into like fantasy, then semi fantasy, then reality. You know? Okay. Yeah. So where did so did you have an inspiration? Like where did this come from? I mean, I think when I was small. Um, there, there was a family's house that I used to go to with my mother, and it was so boring. I must have been maybe my daughter's age, between 8 and 12. And um, there was one guy there that would be there, and he was an you know, older guy. He would have all these horror books, and he would take them out, and I would literally sit with him and look at Creature of the Black Lagoon and Bela Lugosi. And I don't know, I, I, I guess from an early age, horror wasn't scary to me. Horror was, you know, it was, it was movies, it was characters. Mm -hmm. So I just thought... I could play a vampire. You know, I just thought, he don't sleep, he needs blood. You know, like, I wasn't going to get into all that boo stuff, you know. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was just trying to play the basic thing of that and put it in a modern uh, circumstance, you know. You know, I, we have a scene where uh, a girl was dating a guy in my movie, and um, he got into a fight with her in real life. So we you say, he's in the doghouse, right? So she was like, oh, I, I want to get a scene with a, with a cage, you know. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, him as a cage, and you... You out of the cage and you tell them off and you're going out to drink or go out and party and you're leaving them there. I was like, it's just like real life. So taking real circumstances like with couples, you know, the metaphors and yeah. putting them into the vampire life. And I think that uh, in a strange way, people identify with it and they don't know why. Mm -hmm. you know, because when you set out just to scare people, I don't think you scare them. I think, I think you set out to, to, to uh, connect them to them. Feel It's almost like this movie would be from the monster's point of view opposed mm -hmm. to the human point of view where... See them scary. This this would be like reality TV of horror. <laughs> okay, so when you said you've been doing this since two thousand and three. Yeah. So so what is the time? And I don't know the actual timeline of like when these movies these came movies out. Started, yeah, two thousand thirteen became the first one. Hurricane Sandy just passed. Okay. That's when I started. Okay. My first scene in Staten Island. Yeah. And uh, you know I got guys from the Warriors in it. I got Chi Chi from Scarface. I got Ron Jeremy. Mm -hmm. I got Michael Musto, Michael Alec, who was a club kid who uh, went to jail for killing someone. Yeah. And um, went 17 years. And Lilo Brancato from the Bronx Tale. Mm -hmm. The one. You know. So it's like a crazy crew of people that I got, you know. It's, just, it's fascinating because it just started with me being an actor, wanting to 
act myself and then saying, okay, let me grab a camera and start shooting. Mm-hmm. And I kept going, kept going. Then we won the Coney Island Film Festival and just said, well, we got to do better. We mm-hmm. got to do better. We got to do better. You know, so. so before we started, we were talking about things that are coming and what's going on. Yeah. Um, what's new with this? Because I've seen a lot you've been yeah. sharing on Instagram yeah. lately yeah. that there's seemingly some steam behind this and so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah, uh, what's going on right now is, I mean, it's a, a really big moment for me because I passed what they call, you, you guys probably know, the codec, the compressing of codec to uh, HQ422 and PCM uh, audio, you know, things I never knew before. I mean, my end file was DV when mm-hmm. it finished. So in, in short, there's a certain exact way that this has to be for Amazon and I, iTunes to accept. Mm-hmm. And if you can't do that, it's like your whole deal could be over. Okay. So I, I've sat in my house and actually thought, I did all this work. Mm-hmm. I got Sony Orchard, which is just going to distribute my movie. Mm-hmm. And I could fuck up here. Like, like it, maybe it could not happen. Mm-hmm. And just like yesterday morning, I got word that QS, which is a QC quality control, said it passed. So that means June 21st, our date is set for... So June 21st, I can sit on my couch and watch the trilogy. Yeah. Yeah, man. Okay. Yeah. So what's next? Um, there is a film that I made with a lot of passion in 2003. I think I finished about 2007 or 2008. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was called Japanese Borscht. And it was about a guy who goes out with a, a woman who has a child. And the child sort of becomes his child, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the brother comes out of jail who's a gangster. And he sort of meets the guy doesn't really like him. There's a party, and at this party, one of his friends, they're all like mobsters, uh, gives him $100,000, and at this party, uh, the money disappears. So they come to the deduction, uh, it, was, it was just his boyfriend. Just his boyfriend. So he basically is excommunicated from the family. You know, he gives the girl a ring, she's like, where'd you get the money for this? And he doesn't know what she's talking about. So he can't see the kid, he goes to see the kid, he gets arrested. So one day he stumbles, he meets a, a Japanese friend of his from Fashion Institute, who I took it a lot of my life, and... Um, the guy's like, hey, come to Japan with me. We'll make some money. And he doesn't realize when he goes out there that they're Yakuza. So he starts, wind up working with the Yakuza in J- Japan. But on the on the return back, the whole thing is like a mirror because one of the guys is going through the same thing with, with his girlfriend. When they come back, the Yakuza help fight the mobsters so that he can see his daughter again. So, it's, so basically what I'm saying is I'm shooting a film that I shot already. Okay. So what, what made you decide to go take the second stab at it? Um, because or, or the third, or fifth, I, yeah, however yeah, many. Yeah, this would be the second because I didn't have the equipment. You know, I didn't. Uh-huh. Have, you know, I right now I have a friend named Josh. You know, he's got a Canon, uh, Canon, five Mark D, four, uh, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. And he he's a single guy. He's got no girlfriend, no family. His house, his apartment is in a is on a. Um, you would love this spot. Right there, uh, where Tower Records was, uh, I can't remember. Uh, not Mercer, but you know, Great Jones, like right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bond, Bond. Bond. Yeah, beautiful. He, he got his apartment. His whole family moved out. When I met this man, it was in Coney Island. He was walking to the bathroom and he had a camera. And I just said to him, "What camera is that?" And you know, I said, "You should come shoot when I shoot." You know, I figured he'd take stills or whatever. The guy, but I talked him into shooting my first Vamp Bikers. The guy is a full-fledged videographer now. His whole apartment, I mean, is literally. You know, when people hoard, he's yeah. hoarding film equipment. <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't know Did if... you have places like that, Brandy? <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore, okay. <laughs> I don't know if he came back because of Amazon, maybe, yeah, yeah. you know. But he's gung-ho to do this, so that means I literally have somebody... Like, I'm directing for free, mm-hmm. he's shooting for free, and we're just running the dice and see what we could get. So that's our next move right there. So I, I, I don't even know when to start, because I feel like I, I should keep promoting Vamp Bikers... But I'm tempted to jump on it early. I think I gotta. I think I gotta take a little time. I mean, if you're if you're gonna drop, you gotta do the whole, right? You know, I, the whole press, promo yeah, press exactly, exactly. routine. I got, I got a press guy that you know I'm gonna pay a little something to see if he can get us out there. Maybe Variety or whatever, Hollywood Reporter. We can see because if we get a couple of artists, because I do have Ron Jeremy, and I do have Chi Chi from Scarface, and Lilo, people that do have an audience. You know what I mean? So. I'm hoping to, to capitalize on that, but you know, if not, then the next film... Well, I mean, you, you could just cut up the movie into 30-second segments and share it on Instagram to direct traffic. Yeah, I guess so. I guess that, so. that probably makes just as much sense. Yeah. You know, and then, yeah. and then when you see, like, which videos actually do well based on spending a little bit of money, 
then yeah. you could pour more money directly into right. that. Right. Um, I mean, I know that's working just for me right now yeah. in my business. Yeah, yeah. So it's literally applicable, like, like across the breadth of anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't really know how this whole thing works. I just, I've been so deep into it. I like making them. Uh -huh. I'm so interested in making them and I enjoy it. I've met people that don't look like they enjoy making it. Right. They have money yeah. and they have the product and they're doing stuff. But yeah. They look at me and they, yeah. I know they don't have the depth of what I got. Yeah. And, and I know that their product is not going to be like mine. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. You know, they're, they're people with power and people, you know, but they, you know, they don't have the soul. You know, they're not into it. You know, what I mean? you know everybody's different. That's what I've realized in life. And, yeah. and, and not everybody has the same experiences because they don't, they're not all brought up the same. Exactly. You know, like living, you're definitely a little bit older than me, but like yeah. living through the period that I did in New York, yeah. I think makes me look at things differently than like the generation a half behind me. Yeah. Like millennials that yeah. grew up in a totally technology era. Yeah. And not like uh, you get on the subway and keep your exactly. head down and don't look at anybody era. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking today, like I used to do graffiti and we do a wall. Mm -hmm. It would take eight hours. Yeah. But, you know, you go to school and, you know, the girls like you. And then, you know, the, the guys are a little bit like, oh, yo, what's up, Spade? You know, you, 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 you get used to that. And then you get older and you realize, well, I can put a picture on Instagram now and more people can see it. And I get, that's crazy. Somebody yeah. in their house could just create something, not even get their knees dirty, nothing. Right. You know, no real yeah. risk. And they just throw up a picture and, and everybody likes it. And you're like, wow. you know, It's just, it just such a crazy way of thinking like I'm not used to it yet my, my generation is not used to it yet we engage in it yeah, yeah. I, you know it's, it's not something I, I get there's some kids you see them they're 20 years old they got thousands of followers and you're like how the fuck you know where did that come from you know but I guess you know and my old school mentality is like I don't really give a shit like I think the people who follow me should be people that are interested in what I'm doing that's it you know it's not that I, you know I, want to, I don't want tons of followers but you know I want people to follow me that like what I'm doing, you know. I mean, it's a different way to. I, I don't definitely look at it like that. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's why everybody has different opinions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I'll I'll get other people to handle those things. I mean, I, you know, I'm deeply involved in uh, the making of it. You know, that that, that really interests me, mm -hmm. and I do a lot of. Uh, I really, these things come to me. You know, I could be getting a massage, yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden figure out the end of the movie, right? And just see it completely, and now call the actors. Yeah. And usually, what I do is I'll just talk them, talk. Them. You know, get them all pumped up. And they come in, there's a script, but it's more of the experience that I shared with them mm -hmm. over the phone, probably, that makes the scene. Right. Because by the time they walk in, because I say, when it's a big day and we're going to shoot, sometimes you don't get a chance to really talk deep right. about the character and all that. Yeah, yeah. just standing around. So, by that point, you and me have evolved in that week. Right, Since right. we talked, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it could be the simplest thing. It could, but, you know, I mean, the, trans, the translation of visions into... The physical world is what I'm interested in. So, so you were talking about throwing up um, spade back yeah, in the day. Yeah, yeah. Where you are you originally from? New York. Yeah, I, I grew up maybe like like ten blocks from here. Wow. I was on the East Second. I could tell you. Okay. Yeah, that's where I was from. So, what what do you remember about your childhood in New York? Oh, I mean, well, like, like that's comparatively different now that you have a child. Oh yeah, yeah completely. Because now we take our kids. And we got our arms around them everywhere we go, and we're ready to knock out anybody that comes near them. Back then, you know, you know, there's a couple of parents outside. You leave your kid outside. You're like, yeah, I'm going in. Oh, yeah, she can stay out here. And some other people watch your kid, and you didn't mind. And you look at the window. Hey, you got this. There was no, really, the, just had a phone, but you can't call them. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge difference the way I grew up, to, where my daughter grew up. And I'm not going to say that it's tougher now. It definitely is not that. It, it was definitely tougher then mm -hmm. for kids. You know, the rite of passage, you walk on a block. What are you doing on my block? What are you looking at me for? Fuck you. <laughs> Spick. They, they use every word you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, every word. Horrible. The cops would chase you. Come here, you wet back. You wouldn't believe the things that came out of it. You know, it was normal. Yeah. This was normal. We go to high school. All my friends were black. I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. I go to a school. We get chased out of school. You know, to the train, they will get beat up. So the wording, that everything has changed because everybody's so politically correct. Right. And, and hopefully people have a conscience as to why they're not doing it, not because they're just being politically correct. But it was a different world. We stood on the corner. 
You still have the boy. That was your Instagram. That was your Facebook. Yeah. You know, you have a fight, you punch somebody in the face. That that everybody hears about it. That you know, you we learn to work that way. So it's you know, this is very like you know, I'm catching on to it, but it definitely is not. It's 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 not the way I grew up for social media. So, Publicity, mm -hmm. publicity was hands on. You know right, I mean? right, no, it was right. a different world because you, yeah. you you weren't able to do it directly. Yeah. Now because of technology, anybody can do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you have the skill set and, and the yeah. desire and, and the there drive. There was so much uh, rite of passage in every every way. Like you had to be tough, you had to be strong, you had to stand up, you, you had to get beat up, and you have to learn. You know, now it's 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 just like that. It's almost like the nerd has dominance now. The nerd, Correct. yeah, the nerd has dominance because they can handle all these the, the computer and you know, so they can even look stronger than a, a person who probably in real life might be stronger than them. Correct. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, I, I think uh, we, you know, the the, the facility, the, the the faculty to to create a facade is very easy now. I mean, I see quiet people in real life that don't say shit, and on fucking Facebook they're saying all these things, and you're looking at them, you know, like. They're bold and brave, and they're, oh, I'll get girls, and, you know, you're looking at this, and you're, I got money, and in real life, you sit with them, they don't say a peep, you know, so I, I, you know, I'm an outspoken person, so I just, but, you know, it was just a different world, and I'm, I'm slowly grasping that, that's what it was, and that's okay, you know what I mean, that's just the way it was, you know, raps changed, you know, it used rap, to be lyrics rap, and smarts, and, and now changed. somebody says, well, we don't have to follow those rules, we could mumble, and who, who, who's to say that that's wrong, like, yeah, okay, it can't compare in rap, lyric, but in music, well, this is what people like. Right, so right. It sucks, but... I, I, I agree with you on the mumble shit. One thousand percent. Although there is, I, I have to say, there are some rappers now that, yeah. that would have stood the Lithmus lith test in yeah. the 90s, which is my hip-hop. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, definitely. I like Panda, the designer Panda. Yeah. I, I, he's like, he's like, yeah. But it's good. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. To me, it was better than a lot of stuff I heard. Yeah, yeah, so grew up ten blocks away. You're here now. Like, do you see envision yourself dying in New York? Um, I think so because I think New York is not a place to live. It's a state of mind. I think you come from other places to be in New York. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a fast paced mind. It's a it's a person that's active that wants to do things that's you know aggressive and so forth. And I, you know, my mother in 1990 she moved her business to the city. And when she moved to business to the city, I was in Brooklyn in a, a rent control apartment. And I, I found that when I would go to Manhattan, it was so, it was so different. You know, you, you walk outside, people are boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. You know, in Brooklyn, it's a little more like people uh, talking about people and talking about people. But that whole Manhattan thing is, is the mentality is coming into Brooklyn. Like, it's, it's almost like people are business-like, people are less talkative, less commutative, less gossipy, you know what I mean? It almost seems a little bit more like Manhattan. Manhattan... You know, sometimes you don't even know your neighbors. I, I, that's not how I feel. I mean, yeah. They're nice. You, you know, in the lobby, there'll be a, a, a wreath. There'll be the menorah. Yeah. You know, it's for everybody. You know, it's a yeah. kind of feeling. You know, here it could bog down into, you get a place with a bunch of Christians. You get a place with a bunch of Jews. You get a place with a bunch of Muslims. You know, it could really be set. Yeah. In Manhattan, you get that kind of feeling. But, um, I mean, I, I would say I would die in New York. I mean, I, I mean, because you know why? Because the pace. Yeah. Going any slower can't imagine it but i guess at 70 probably that'll start happening yeah. no 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 of course absolutely i find it i find it interesting because i engage with less and less people that are born and raised here yeah like you know the the, the conversations that i have are you know well i was from here or i went here and yeah. i've been here for 10 years and that's great yeah. but there's there's when you've seen new york change yeah you know when you could when you remember what this block used to be like yeah, or, or whatever right, it may right. be it's it's different Right. You have a different essence in you. Talking about block parties and you know, I haven't seen a block party in so long. Right, I, I and they used to be everywhere. Yeah, all you do is file a permit with the fucking police department or whatever. I don't even think it was the city at that point. I remember my aunt; she worked with the auxiliary police department. We used to beg her, "Can we do it? Can we do it?" I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask. And one day we just take the the the, the uh, what they call it, the guard, yeah, you know, and just put them on the corner. And we actually started having one for about a half a day until the police came and said, "What are you doing?" Yeah. You know, but you know, we just thought if you put them there, we could have it. You know, but it was it was a completely different world. The the, the internet, the way it hit, I guess my generation probably is the hardest because it's the biggest lapse and change in intelligence. So, and you know, and understanding. I mean, 
you have every answer to every question. Well, know? what we're seeing, what I believe, um, and what some other people contend, is that we're seeing the same seismic shift now that our parents saw when it went from radio to TV. I guess so. And, and what we're seeing is we're seeing it shift from TV to internet. Yeah. Because the reality is, is do you, I mean, if you think just about like your own personal self, right? In, and, and granted, you're in a demo that's probably not as internet or usage and savvy, so on and so forth. But like, think about how much TV you watched five years ago. Yeah. You probably don't watch as much TV now. But you probably consume just as much through what you're looking at on social YouTube, or YouTube or, Netflix, or whatever. Yeah. Right, exactly. So it's just, it's where we're putting our attention has changed. Yeah. And because of technology, yeah. now anybody could be the distributor. Yeah. Like you could put your movies on YouTube. Yeah. If you wanted to, yeah. and just give them away. Yeah. Now that may not work for your structure, and that's that's fine. But like the technology exists where right. anybody with right. the capacity. A can. guy like me couldn't make a film, you know, whatever, ten years ago the way I'm making now. Right. You know, and it pass and almost compete with big films. It's possible, you know, because I mean, you know, for me, films are sight and sound. Mm -hmm. If you're able to, if if you could hear my film and you can see it already. That means now all I have to do is really have your attention. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, some people who could have the greatest sound, the greatest sight, but they have no story. That could happen too. So you really have a real, you know, you know, democracy of, of filmmaking now. I mean, of course, there's SAG, and that, that's another thing where I can't make a SAG film because I can't pay everybody. Like, you know, SAG, you have to pay the guy who came on the set, the sound guy, the... the right, right, right. You know, we'll be able to, guy you got to bootstrap it, yeah. Yeah, you know, so I couldn't do that. So in actuality, a guy like me... You know, Amazon is probably like my last stand and Netflix mm -hmm. because they, they're taking me now. Maybe one day they're going to say, well, we made a deal with SAG so we cannot take a film that's not SAG. That I, I doubt that'll happen. I hope not. And I'm, I, 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 I don't think so because you got to think because the, the, the reality is, is we're getting to a point where shit like that I just don't think is going to be important anymore. Yeah, I'm glad because yeah, because not. the skill sets because the barrier to entry yeah. has become so small yeah. because of technology. Yep. Yeah. Um, because anybody can do. It. I mean, you take your phone. You can make. We were just talking about it. The movie shot on fucking cell phones now. Right. Um. I think we're interfacing with the machine, and yes. trying, trying to be the machine. We, we're we're, we're going to totally integrate. And, and and the truth is that we can. So it's an inevitable loss against the machine. I think. Like in other words, we're gonna we're gonna lose against the machine. Oh, one thousand percent intelligent, and it's it, it's almost like man reaching the point of understanding his limits and not accepting them. Right, like almost trying to 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 be something you can you cannot be these things that machines do. You cannot, you know, like before I'd sit down and I'd draw something really nice and I put it up on the internet. And I realized, like, my cousin, who don't draw at all, could take a picture, put it in a program, and it looked like it was oil painted. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why the fuck am I going to sit down and oil paint now? Sometimes, the, you know, these things right. cross your mind. If, even if I take a picture of this, somebody will think I did it in a program, maybe. Right. So it's almost like the need for reality basically doesn't really matter because it's almost like in the, in the electric world, in the computer world, what is it? What, what is it really? Uh -huh. So, you know, I think at a certain point, art and everything's going to disappear. But the beginning of art, right? You had huge concrete statues chiseled, right? Right, right, right. So that they can make so it all the way now. Right. So they can make it to now. Now you have digital art, which literally is nothing, up somewhere. So one is there since the beginning of time, so it can make it here. And the other one, you can make like nothing. So they'll never, you know, we're, we're, lo we're losing something. But I, I'm not one to say that it's for the bad. I'm just saying it's change. You know, it's, it's change. I mean, it's, it's obviously not good for... Me and some people, you know, but it's change. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be better for you, though? Because isn't it, isn't it then easier to put your shit out? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm just saying that for me to sit down and edit and chop and, and learn to edit like I did, you know, my daughter at eight years old probably could edit something right now. Right. So when that, by the time she's my age, she's going to fucking kill me in editing. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm just saying, like, what I'm trying to say is that it is good for me, but what I'm trying to say is your competition is, is big now in everything because, like, like me, anybody in their house could be making a film now. You know, it's not just... Right, but most people... The, the, different, the difference is, is everybody has the capability, but not everybody has the, the wherewithal. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or the persistence. Yeah. Because yeah. anybody can buy this equipment and shoot a podcast. Right. Anybody yeah. can hire right. this guy, right? right? 
prior to hiring him, I put out 300 pieces of content myself. Right. So it was like... You wanted to do it. Right. So now now when Endurance, we yeah. when we were, like sit together and work together, like I'll look at something and I'll be like, no, change this, change this. More from a directoral standpoint. Right. 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 Um, or production standpoint, whatever yeah. you want to label it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just because I've done it. Like, and... Yeah. and I just I just see the changes continuing. Like, you, you you hit something right on the head, which I can't really sometimes verbalize. But there, yeah, there's a certain endurance run in any given passion that determines how great you are. Mm-hmm. Because what I'm trying to say is, what I started in 2003. You'd laugh yeah. at me, and you'd you see what a, you uh-huh. look at what a clown work I'm doing. Uh-huh. And but with the years I pack on, I become dangerous. Right. You know, but the next movie. Yes, like, right, like, right. like in theory, like, and 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 I haven't watched them, so I don't know. But let's let's just let's just play I'll devil's advocate, answer. right? Let's say let's say it bombs the trilogy. Like the internet really gets it, and they're like, "Fuck this guy," yeah. right? Yep. That's okay. The yeah. next one exactly. could be a fucking viral exactly. hit. And really, what it is is that 2003 yeah. to 2018 yeah. was the deuce. Yeah. And then to for them the internet to say you're an overnight success. Yeah. Because that's always what happens. Yeah. Um, oh, but really, I, the things I've learned—I mean, you know, everything from a signed release mm-hmm. to somebody giving you music, hey, say, "Hey, put put your music in my movie." And the day you do, and the day you got Amazon, and the day you hand it into Sony Orchard, yeah. somebody goes, "No, but I want to give you WAV files," and you're like, "No, I just cut it up. It's fine." No, 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 please ask them for the movie, and and I'm like, "No, I I got a deal." They're like, "Oh, well, you could get another deal." I'm like, I said, I told this one guy, Man Parish, he made a song called Hip Hop Bebop was one of the biggest songs back around, you know, African Bambada time and all that. Yeah. And this guy is like a New York legend. And this fucker did this to me. You know, he, he, he literally asked me to exchange his films. And I said, let me just put it to you this way. If you make me go and ask Sony for my movie back to remove your files, to put in better ones, I said, I'm going to remove your files and I'm going to put all my friends' music in it. I said, so there you go. It's... They stay how it is, or it, your your music is out. I've had this conversation with so many people because, unfortunately, I never thought none of this would make it anywhere. So I didn't ask nobody to sign nothing. Right, right, right. I never thought of that, yeah. and I always thought if if I did make it, people would be happy. Right. But do you realize the beast comes out? It, it's the. I had one girl tell me, "Oh, I just don't like the way I'm portrayed in there." I said, "You don't want to be on Amazon or Netflix." She's like, "Oh, I don't, I don't." Then she said to me on the paper, it "Didn't say Sony." And I said to her, my release does not say Sony, so you think maybe you shouldn't sign it because it's not Sony? I said, okay, yeah, maybe it's not Sony. And I replaced her. Because yeah. she don't fucking believe it, she'll, she'll watch it on TV. So it's a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't believe the amount of things that I went through. Uh, so, so knowing what you know now, 15 years in, yeah, would you have done anything differently from the jump? Well, I mean, of course I would have had people... Sign all the releases on Vampires before I even started. Mm-hmm. Had no idea where it was going. Had no idea I would win anything. I won at the Cody Island Film Festival, and and the next year I won Best Music Video with Melly Mel and Grand Pooba and these rappers. And the third time, I felt like they took advantage of me because I filled up the theater like twice. And you know, it's it's I I, I didn't say I have to win, but I lost to like a, a twelve minute. German horror film, and no disrespect, but isn't this the Coney Island Film Festival? Like, it's a, it's a German country making a movie and bringing it here and winning. You know, I was like, okay, you know, whatever. I just, you know, I had a little debate with the guy, but I'm like, you know what? This is a sign to just move on. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, sometimes things happen right. for you to move on, and just to come back with something from Amazon and Google, Google Play and all that is the best sort of success is revenge. You know, right, right. You know, so, you know, I just thought, you know, but. I mean, I definitely would have had people sign releases and all that. You know, I just never thought I'd see people do these things. I, there are three or four people that literally, like, got me to reshoot them. And it's like, you can't even fathom why. You act, you go to school, you pay for headshots, you get in a movie, it gets into festivals. But I was a weird person. When I acted, you see, the thing is, I liked what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So when somebody shot me in black and white at New York Film Academy... When the guy was going to edit, Eric, I'm going to edit. Can I come? I, I want to sit with him. Yeah. What song are you going to pick for that? That was me. Yeah. But I get people. I shot them. I put them in 
Anthology Film Archives, which is on Second Avenue where Warhol and all these people play. I'm not saying it's fucking Hollywood, but I'm saying it's a movie theater. They don't even show up to the movie. So I think to myself, why did you pay for headshots? Why did you go to acting school? Because most people don't ask you. They don't want to do it. There's so, pe- yeah. You know what I learned, Mike? Is that a lot of people say it, but they don't want it. Yeah. They don't really want to make it. And the truth is, there's nothing you can do about that. Right. And now with, now with, now with the internet, you can just pretend like you're that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got people fooled. But know. but the reality is, is anybody that's really out there working, hustling, yeah. sees right through that shit immediately. Oh, hell yeah. It, it's because listen, you're always you know that's like if why somebody guys wants to make it. That's why you make it. Right. That's why I'll make it because people out there are semi trying. You, they're like, I want to be an actor. You'd be like, I met Spielberg yesterday. He said to give him a call. He liked your picture. Oh yeah. They never probably, call. They probably won't call him. Yeah. There's people call. like that. Yeah. And for me, that's far fetched yeah. because if you gave me any chance, boy, I mean. Right, but I guess that's when you notice the differences between you yeah. and other people. Yeah. You know? Cool. So what is what was the date again that's coming uh, up? June twenty one. So June twenty one on Amazon. It should be on Amazon. Yep. That's dope. That's dope. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Anything else you want to share before we wrap? Um, I I, I just want to thank Mike. I think he's one of the greatest uh, real estate guys <laughs> ever, and I, I just I just have a great connection with a, anybody. The people that I, I do real estate with that I've actually got to know. You know, I always liked them because I don't know. It's I don't know. It's just you guys got to be social. You got to be with people, and those are the best people. So Mike is a great guy. Definitely see him about getting an apartment. Thank you, thank you. All right, guys, I appreciate all your time. Thank you, Eric, for joining us. Thank you, brother. See you guys soon. Yeah.